Hey guys, and welcome back to Art Theories. But more importantly, welcome to Vegas. America's playground, baby. It's kind of assumed that Las Vegas is not an architecturally serious place. People kind of call it tacky or vulgar. And yes, it may be both those things, but it's also architecturally very radical and its construction signified a big shift in American architecture. Boom! According to the book, Learning from Las Vegas, written in 1972 by Venturi, Scott and Brown, with the rise of Las Vegas, we saw the return of symbolism and the rise of pop cultural references within architecture and city planning. But what on earth does that even mean? Well, to answer that question, we have to look at the sorts of buildings America was making outside of Vegas at the same time. In this period, architects were generally concerned with space, light, material and gesture. Buildings aimed to be original and architects saw themselves as heroic figures, leaving their unique mark on the city. But Las Vegas was different. The architecture of Las Vegas wasn't concerned with space, light or form. It wasn't concerned about being unique. It was actually perfectly happy to copy something which had already existed somewhere else. The architecture of Las Vegas had a different priority and that was communication. Communicating with potential customers who were in cars shooting down the highway that their casino is the best. And the main way that casinos communicated with potential customers was through signs and symbols. This may seem very new, but it's actually a continuation of something much older. If you look at a medieval city, we can also see that it relied on signs and symbols to communicate information. In Vegas, there's loads and loads of casinos and they're all trying to get your attention. They're all trying to get you to park your car in their parking lot and go into their establishment so they can take your money. And what this meant was that a series of visual one-upmanships had to take place, a visual arms race, if you will, where each casino had to be more extravagant and more grand than the last one in order to get the customers in. This led to a series of aesthetic innovations which have deep roots in the history of architecture and visual language. And in this environment, it was signs and symbols rather than space and form which took priority. The priority was communicating with the customer who was in their car driving at high speeds down the highway. That meant the signs and symbols had to be massive, had to be angled to the road. Ideally they'd flash or rotate or something like that, but they had to get your attention and there were loads of other signs and symbols trying to get your attention as well. According to the book, there were two kinds of buildings which were designed to suit this new architectural environment. The first one is called a decorated shed, and that's basically a very functional warehouse style building, probably with a low ceiling to save on air conditioning bills, which has a massive sign or several massive signs in front of it. And basically the building is just normal and standard and it outsources its personality and its character to the sign, which does all that work for it. A lot of the time with decorated sheds, the sign is actually more expensive than the building itself. The second kind of building which was designed for this new environment is called a duck building and I absolutely love duck buildings. Basically it's when the building becomes a symbol for the product that it sells. And I know that sounds super vague so I'll just show you some examples but here's the original duck building and like it's a duck and it either sold ducks or eggs, I can't remember off the top of my head, but you know what I mean? And there's so many examples in America of this kind of thing, but I even saw one in London, which made me very happy. It's, um, it's not a building, it's a water fountain, but it's part of the environment and it's a water droplet to say, you can get water here. I love it. I think it's so cool. I'm all about duck buildings, but it's not even a surprise that duck buildings and this kind of architecture cropped up around this, the late 50s, 60s and 70s, this was architecture that was borrowing stylistically a lot from pop art. And you get artists like Klaus Oldenburg who were also taking familiar objects 
expanding their size massively and putting them in new contexts in a similar monumental way. This kind of architecture may seem very new and avant-garde, but actually the writers point out that it's a continuation of a much older trend within architecture. Medieval cathedrals also had massive facades which were designed to impress passers-by and to bring them in, and these cathedrals also relied on a very heavy and complex set of symbols and signs to convey messages. Dude, how can you be unashamedly praising the architecture of Las Vegas when it's a city built on greed and exploitation? You haven't even mentioned the ethics of casinos in this video. All right, fair point work, Tom. Yes, gambling and casinos are bad, but would you make that point if I was talking about a Baroque cathedral? Would you be like, oh, but the Catholic Church did really bad things, so you shouldn't talk about this building? No, you wouldn't, because you're a hypocrite. That's why, okay? Anyway, that's all for me. Thank you so much for watching. Like, subscribe, follow me on Instagram, um, hit the bell button. I don't know. Thanks very much for watching.